Hi everyone, welcome. It's Paul Tilly, and welcome back to MR2350 eBusiness. Today we're looking at Unit 4, Internet Marketing Communications. In this unit, we're looking at how the message, the website, the web page, the company, the social media site, any mechanism that you would use as a company, how that contacts customers and how customers can in turn feed back to the business. We're going to identify the key features of the internet audience and the basic concepts of consumer behavior and purchasing and how consumers behave online. We're going to identify and describe the basic digital commerce marketing and advertising strategies and tools. We're identifying and describing the main technologies to support this online marketing. We're going to describe the costs and benefits of online marketing communications. We're going to describe the differences between traditional online marketing and new social media level marketing. We're going to talk a little bit about relationship marketing from a social, mobile, and local marketing perspective. We're going to describe the social marketing process from fan acquisition right up to the sale. And we're going to look at it on three platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. And we're going to identify key elements of the mobile marketing and, and how we'll develop a campaign for local marketing and we're going to describe the capabilities of local based local marketing and we're going to describe the capabilities of location based local marketing this is unit four and it reflects chapters six and seven in the textbook so please give that a read first of all we got to really describe what exactly internet marketing communications is and perhaps no other area of business is more affected by the internet and mobile platform technologies than marketing and marketing communications. So marketing, you know, if you think about how much has changed in the last 10, 15 years with regards to how we market material, many companies have left traditional radio, traditional television, traditional print media, walked over to online media and online marketing. And we've seen the demise of newspapers, TV stations, and the like because of that, because advertising dollars, are, dollars have literally shifted to an online environment. As a communication tool, tool, the Internet affords marketers new ways of contacting millions of people, and probably the biggest advantage is that it's relatively low cost per eyeball. The Internet also provides new ways often instantaneous and often spontaneous to gather information from customers, adjust product offerings, and try, try to increase consumer value. So when we think of the stats, the stats really tell the story. They paint a picture of a world that has moved digital. Online marketing and advertising spending has become very, very prominent. Uh, spending has increased over 20% a year over the period 2015 to 2020. At the same time, most forms of traditional marketing and advertising have seen either flat or declining revenues. Two thirds of all digital advertising spending is over a mobile advertising platform. Just to illustrate how much mobile is important. So your phone, your tablet, any mobile device is now a big marketing tool or a big component of the marketing tool. Digital marketing ads remain the fastest growing ad format, with spending anticipated an increase in 2020 by over 10% despite COVID. And probably we could say that it's actually partially because of COVID, because the digital platform has allowed people to communicate. Social network advertising and marketing spending continues to expand. Facebook, for example, has garnered a lot of sales, Google a lot of sales, and they've, they've done that at the expense of traditional marketing vehicles. Viewability issues and ad fraud continue to be a problem. We've got some serious concerns with it. And native advertising and other forms of content marketing is certainly on the rise as we look forward through this decade. Big data is, a, is how the internet works. It is drawing on huge amounts of data to be able to make inferences about customer demand, customer needs, customer wants. We have seen some issues come up with that. Ad blocking, for example, this software creates a concern for both online publishers and advertisers. If your ads can't get to your customer, 
then you know it kind of underlines under war undermines the value of this type of system to marketers online tracking produces oceans of data and how are we ever going to analyze it you know it's challenging to be able to analyze the huge amounts of data that come in to say where paul has gone in his internet searches on his page views how long he stays uh, what he looked at, what he didn't look at, his his favorite choices in terms of colors and things like that. These are what we call data that gets collected to be able to do a better job at figuring out what the customer wants. But there's so much of it, you really need a, a monster of a computer and monster programs to really kind of capture and get some some real hard information out of all that data. Uh, targeting uh, Target advertising based on behavioral Tracking leads to growth and privacy awareness and fears. I think all of us have experienced that now. If you search for something online, suddenly whatever you search for comes up in your Facebook feed. So there's an obvious connect between what you search for and what Facebook is seeing that you've been searching for. And a lot of people are a little creeped out by that. And marketers have become increasingly concerned about the placement of their ads next to controversial online content. So, for example, if there's a riot somewhere or a, um, a war or someone is killed, you don't want to see your ad on that story. And, you know, where, where do your ads go? And also advertising boycotts. We think of, for example, um, someone like Neil Young pulling their, their information off or pulling their material off Spotify because of a political concern that Neil raises with another person that is on that on that platform. From an engagement point of view, we got to think about, you know, owners of mobile devices spend over four and a third hours a day using them for non-telephone activities. The, the traditional cell phone has certainly become much more than a phone. You know, people view videos, they visit social networks, they play games, a lot of activity there. Engaging in such activities is very widespread. In 2020, almost 245 million users watch videos, over 210 million visit social network, and over 175 million pay, play uh, some form of digital game. And millions of others listen to music or shop. As the amount of time spent using mobile devices continues to increase, it's beginning to generate somewhat of a backlash. You know, um, Apple, for instance, has introduced several features that help users monitor and set limits on their smartphone usage. Again, we've got this internet addiction problem that, that keeps rising. If we look at demographics, you know, the demographic profile of the internet and e-commerce has changed greatly since 95 when all this really started. Up until 2000, single white young college educated males with high income dominated the internet. So it was the upwardly mobile. And we saw that people with less education weren't on the internet. And we called it a digital divide because there was the have and have nots. And they were very clearly defined. But in recent years, there's been a marked increase in internet usage by females, minorities, seniors, and families with modest income. So that digital divide has more or less been erased to some degree. It's not eliminated, but to some degree. And this has meant that the internet has become more ubiquitous than it ever was. A roughly equal percentage of men and women in the United States use the internet today, and we assume the information is about the same for Canada. We, there is no stat specifically for Canada, so we used uh, U.S. data. Women comprise 50% of the U.S. internet users, and about 49, 50% women, 50% uh, men. So women comprise 50% of the U.S. internet market, and men about 50% as well. Young adults, 18 to 24, form the age group with the highest percentage of internet use at over 99%, followed closely by teens, 12 to 17, which is about 97%. Adults in the 25 to 54 group are also strongly represented with percentages around 90%. Another fast-growing group out online is the 65 and, and over segment. You know, seniors are online, almost 75% are online. And that, that means that, you know, that's a big population because they're the baby boomers. That's the bubble. And a lot of marketers are looking for that group. Future internet user growth in the United States will come predominantly from those aged 65 and over. And again, the power of the baby boom is coming through there. 
In terms of income and education, about 98% of households with income levels above 75,000 use the internet, compared to only 82% of households earning less than 30,000. Over time, income differences have certainly declined, but they do remain significant with about a 15% gap between the high category and the low category. The amount of education also makes a significant difference when it comes to internet usage over, the, over those individuals with less than high school education, only 71% are online, compared to 98% with people with a college degree or more. Even some college education boosts internet use, with this segment reaching about 95%. Since its early beginnings, the internet has evolved quite a bit. In the mid-2000s, social media became the dominant force in the internet and it introduced a whole new group of people to internet technology. Web 2.0 as it was called was really a major milestone because what it allowed was for interactivity between the buyer, the seller, one person and another, the seller and the buyer, one company and another company. So it, it allowed for a greater degree of communication. Now, a study of 6,000 social network users found that social networks have a powerful, powerful influence on their shopping and purchasing behavior. 40% of social media users have purchased an item after sharing or seeing it on Facebook, Pinterest, or Twitter, one of the main platforms. Facebook is the network that's mostly likely to drive customers to purchase, followed by Pinterest and Twitter. Social networks increase research online, followed by purchases offline. So people will go and do their research online and go and buy it in a store. Sometimes referred to as ROPO, which is research online, purchase offline, or web rooming. Driving purchase traffic into physical stores where the product can be seen tried, and then purchased. This is really the opposite of the showroom effect where customers go and to the store and then go purchase it online. The ROPO, or web rooming effect, has been found to be a large, and it has been really as important as the showroom effect. Membership in social networks has a large influence on discovering such things as new independent music, but less influence on already well-known products. Membership in an online brand community like Ford's Facebook page and community has a direct effect on sales. Definitely connected. So we'll see large companies setting up their own Facebook page. Web, <coughs> Amazon's recommendation system, customers who bought this have also bought, is also used to create co-purchase networking where people will buy more simply on a recommendation. This has a significant influence on people's purchasing behaviors. The value of social networks to marketers rents with the proposition that brand strength and purchase decisions are closely related to network membership, rank, prominence, and centrality. So let's look at customer behavior in the e-commerce environment. Before firms can begin to sell their products online, they must first understand what kinds of people they're dealing with. And they really had to figure out how those people behave. Once firms is understand understanding what people are doing online, they need to focus on how the customers behave online. So the study of customer behavior is a social science discipline that attempts to model and understand the behaviors of humans in the market. So let's take a look at consumer behavior and how it's influenced on the on online environment. First, we've got to recall the consumer purchase decision process that we talked about in first year marketing. Really, there are five distinct stages whenever we go to buy something. First, we recognize a problem. We have some gap between where we are, where we need to be. We feel that we can potentially resolve that problem by buying something or acquiring something that will help us get around that problem. So with the problem recognized, we go out and we search for something. That's the very first major step is going out and doing an information search. Once we search all the information, then we need to evaluate the various alternatives that we come up with in that search. 
once we've done that, we're going to weigh the pluses and minuses and make a purchase decision for the most valuable solution to the potential problem that we've recognized. Once we've made the decision, we've bought the item, we take it home, we use it, and we get to assess whether or not it met our needs. So this is what we call our post-purchase behavior. We either feel good about it or we don't feel good about it. In the online environment, we really need to think about more or different steps that come into play. So if we look at consumer behavior online, it really takes that traditional model that we just reviewed and it adds a couple steps to it. First, consumer, uh, consumer clickstream behavior, and next, the website and mobile platform capabilities. So the value of the internet audience is influenced by the, these things, and the intensity and scope used, the demographics, the other internet connection, the community effects, all of these things are gonna influence us. So this is going to reflect in the consumer clickstream behavior which in turn is going to be further augmented by the fact that the website that you're using and the mobile platform that you're using doesn't allow you to do what you want to do in order to achieve that purchase decision. So online consumer behavior is not that much different than offline consumer behavior, save for the mechanism that really allows you to do the purchases, the actual funnel that brings you to where you need to go. Research has found that major influences that allow us to make these online purchase decisions are really related to simple things. Free shipping, for example, is more likely to influence our behavior to, pit, to click commit to purchase. Trust is another very important factor. You're not going to put your credit card into anyone, so you need to have a degree of trust. And savings is important. The ability to make a purchase without paying tax or paying extra duties or getting a good deal is important. So those are the things that people go looking for. Here we have a couple of diagrams that will further illustrate this idea of consumer behavior online. We look at the typical consumer purchase decision process. And we ask ourselves, oh, well, you know, what online capabilities are there at each stage? If we think about needs recognition stage, the very first stage, well, things like target display ads, target email ads, social media, mass media, TV, radio, print media, social networks, all of those things influence our need recognition. We realize that, hey, we, we got a problem, whether we knew about it or not, now we do know about it. So right here we have a little graphic that talks about the influences both online and offline on the consumer purchase decision process. So if we look at the awareness or need recognition, the very first stage, from an online perspective, we've got targeted display ads that show up on your screen in front of you, targeted email ads which get emailed to you, and social media where you see ads within your social media feed. This matches up with Offline marketing communications, including mass media, such as what you see in TV commercials and the like, radio and the like, print media and the like, but also our social networks, our friends. That's going to affect our needs awareness. In terms of the basic search for alternatives, from an online perspective, search engines, online catalogs, site visits, targeted email, and social work networks certainly allow us with the technology to do some very quick searches. From an offline perspective, catalogs, print ads, mass media, salespeople, product ratings, store visits, and social networks certainly allow us to look at alter, uh, alternatives, find out where information can be had, you know, basically link us up with potential sources to resolve the problem that we've identified. When we look at the alternatives from an online perspective, search engines, online catalogs, site visits, product reviews, user evaluations are very important in, in us evaluating alternatives. For example, you want to buy a car, you look online to see what the reviews of the car are. From an offline world, we, we think of traditional reference groups, your friends, people you know, other people that you relate to, uh, opinion leaders, again, people you relate to, uh, mass media, product raters, store visits, social networks. Again, some overlap between online and offline. 
In terms of the actual purchase, well, purchasing online, we can do it through any number of means, uh, through the electronic connectivity, online promotions, discounts, targeted emails, flash sales, everything like that will drive us to purchase online. And in an offline environment, promotions, direct mail, mass media, and print media are common as well. From a post-purchase behavior, once we've made the decision, we've got to think about our communities of consumption. So, for example, there are web pages from Ford, and Ford will have the Ford Owners Group or the Harley's Owners Group or things like that that you can find in social media feeds or within uh, various forums online. Uh, customer emails, online updates, social networks all provide that post-purchase behavior information. And finally, you know, from an offline world, we, we look at things like warranty, service calls, parts and repair, consumer groups, and social networks as influencing us from the point of view of what do we think of our purchase. What influences our behavior? We look at figure 6-3. We can see culture, social norms, physical, uh, psychological factors, demographic factors, all have an influence on our thoughts with regards to brand communications. This second graphic looks at consumer behavior theory online. You can see the influence of a bunch of things that come into the idea of why are we buying something, okay? First of all, on the left-hand side, you have culture, social norms, uh, psychological factors, background demographic factors. We've talked about those in our earlier marketing courses. They come in and they influence. Now, as we move into the actual purchase, we, we think about our brand, the marketing communication stimuli, the capabilities of the firm, what the website feature is, you know, how easy is it to buy, is it, is it simple to actually make a purchase, the consumer skills, is the consumer tech savvy enough to be able to order online, and what exactly is the product? Certain products lend themselves to buying online, certain products you really want to take a look at before you actually buy them. And that's going to influence your purchasing as attitudes and, and your perceived behavioral control, you know, what you have to, to be able to manage this. So this is going to influence the actual purchase behavior. you notice, speaking of the issue of what we buy online, so in the early days of e-commerce, really small items were the favorite thing online. But if you look today, it's broadened out quite a bit. And you can see in this particular graphic that Consumers are much more confident spending online now than they ever were. Uh, everything from small items to big ticket items. 